please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Signed up over the next 16 minutes, but let's first start with a quick check of the day's trading action today. A day prior to bu the budget, the Lao Street witnessed vile swings across all indices. So let's pull those up for you. The Nifty continued its sell-off from yesterday, but saw a sharp surge close to 30 p.m. That index managed to end above the 11,000 mark with cuts of about one fifth of a percent. So let's pull up Sensex as well. The Sensex witnessed a similar swing and it ended just shy of the 36,000 mark, but the bank Nifty bucked the trend. That index managed to eke out gains of about half a percent. However, if you look at the mid caps, they continue their underperformance even now. The index closed with cuts of more than a percent. Let's bring in Anuj Singhal, who is wrapping the day's trading action one day prior to the budget. Anuj, clearly consolidation setting in, but you know, what are the points that the market is watchful for before the budget? Okay, so quite a volatile day for the market. It was a day of two halves, uh, and, and also a day where large caps and mid caps had a lot of divergence. The bank nifty closed at the highest point of the day while the mid caps were under pressure. Uh, so there was a bit of surge in large cap private financials in last hour of trade. Uh, HDFC Bank, HDFC, Kotak Mahindra, all these stocks did well. Other nifty gainers included names like Reliance, Tata Motors and Gale. On the losing end, you had some names and big ones, Infosys, ITC and Lupin. But really the story is about the unwinding or deleveraging or just sell off in the mid caps and some of these are large cap stocks uh, i mean the the the, the non index large caps we categorize some of them uh, as mid caps but a big fall in stocks like fortis kajaria ceramics reliance naval pc jewelers havels bharat electronics jubilant foodworks tata global so Clearly, there was a bit of selling pressure in some of these names. Uh, tomorrow, of course, is big day. The market first will react to the Fed and after that, the all-important budget. Let's see if uh, this mid-cap correction can come to an end uh, tomorrow. That will be interesting to see. Okay, that is going to be the big question that we will ask after the budget is announced. Thanks, Anuj, for joining in with that. But uh, let's get to an exclusive that uh, just flashed on your screens a short while ago. The race for Benani Cement is witnessing a clash of the titans. Sources suggest the top suitors like KM Bidla's Ultratech, the Dalmya Bharat, Rakesh Chandwala with Radha Krishna Damani will get another chance to match the bid put out by Sajjan Jindal's GSW Steel, the highest so far. Nisha Pudar is here with the latest. Uh, Nisha, what's the update? Thanks for that, uh, Kritika. Of course, uh, this is a hotly contested battle for uh, Binani Cement. It's a prized asset. And remember, this is one such asset where lenders are not taking any haircuts. Full money will have to be paid. Also remember that in the last round of bids, GSW was the highest bidder. Now what has happened is that in the recent twist and turn of events, Ultratech, Dalmia Bharat, along with also Rakesh Junjunwala and Radhakrishna Damani's combo, these three are the most serious aspirants and closest competitors to JSW's bid as well. And they will get another chance to really revise their proposal and give another proposal. And this has only happened uh, just because uh, the resolution professional has included IDBI Bank as the unsecured lender, which, remember, is a guarantor of 1,500 crore rupees loan, which Binani Cement has been a guarantor for in uh, its subsidiary. So, therefore, it's a technicality because of which revised bids can be given by the proposed suitors, and this is going to be used as an opportunity by some of these top cement players like Ultratech, uh, Dalmia Bharat, as well as the investors, Junjunwala and the money, to really up their bid and also fight against JSW in this particular. So this race is not yet over. It is going to be a hotly contested mm. battle, and 5th February is when the revised proposal will be given. Okay, fair enough, Nisha. Thanks for joining in with that. But uh, let's move on to earnings corner. There's a slew of earnings. So let's start with the big one that is going to come in a short while from now. ICICI Bank is expected to announce its third quarter numbers. Any moment, the profit is expected to take a hit this quarter, while the street is keenly watching the movement of stressed assets and any commentary on them. Ritu Singh is here to tell us just what to expect from the numbers. Ritu, take it away. 
Here are some of the key things that the markets will be watching out for from ICICI Bank's results. Number one, it's commentary on asset quality. Divergence is something that ICICI Bank is yet to report. It's one of the few banks that it has yet to reveal uh, what RBI's audit report has said. So in this quarter, that is expected to come out. Slippages below 4,500 crores will be seen as positive. In the previous quarter, ICICI Bank reported slippages of 4,674 crore rupees. Anything below that will be positives. The drill down list or the watch list was at 19,590 crore rupees, which forms about 4.1% of the total loan book. Any movement in that will also be seen very closely. The movement of stressed assets, whether it's sale to asset reconstruction companies or a restructuring of any sort in the form of 525 S4A or SDR, all of that will be seen closely. Uh, loan growth for the bank this time around is expected to be around 8 to 10%. In the second quarter, it, it was a 6.3% growth that we saw. So this time, there could be some improvement on that front. Slippages, according to IDFC Securities, are at 5,300 crore rupees. Net interest income, as per our calculation, should be up 9.9%. And profits could be the lowest in the last seven quarters, down about 25.6% as per CNBC TV18's calculations. In the previous quarter, gross and net NPAs were at 7.87 and 4.43. This time around, there could be a spoil sport in the form of uh, what the divergence uh, report really reveals. So all of the focus is really going to center around what the bank says on asset quality. Okay, so the commentary is largely what we are going to watch, uh, Ritu. Thanks for that. Uh, let's move on to the big core story of the day. In a setback for former Rand Baxi promoters, Malvinder and Shivinder Singh, the Delhi High Court has allowed Japanese pharma firm Daichi Sankyo to collect a whopping 3,500 crore rupees from the Singh brothers. But with this, the court has allowed Daichi to enforce the award granted by Singapore Arbitration Tribunal in 2016. Let's also understand this case and what this means. Ashmit Kumar is here for details. Ashmit, you are in the court today. First, tell us more about the history of the case and also take us through the details of today's verdict and why this uh, uh, penalty, so to speak, was imposed. It's a big setback coming in from Malvinder and Shivinder Singh, a setback that is likely to cost them a sum of 3,500 crore rupees. The Delhi High Court in today's judgment has made it very clear, has upheld Daichi's application uh, with respect to enforcement of a 3,500 crore arbitral award. What that in plain speak essentially means is that both these brothers will now have to cough up a sum of 3,500 crore rupees and pay to Daichi as per the arbitral award that was uh, granted by the Singapore Arbitration Tribunal. Now, just to rewind, 2008 is when Singh brothers sold their stake in Ranbaxi to Daichi for a consideration of $4.6 billion. Five years later, in 2016, the US FDA had raised questions of irregularities for which uh, Daichi had to cough up a settlement fee of $550 million. That's what started uh, the arbitration in the first place between the two sides. Uh, for now, uh, what we understand is that in uh, April of 2016, uh, Daichi had won the arbitral award of 3,500 crores and now today it has been upheld. It has uh, The enforcement has been upheld by the Delhi High Court. Two things, however, need to be kept in mind with respect to the road ahead. Number one is that the Singapore Arbitration Tribunal uh, award is already under judgment, is already under challenge uh, before the Singapore Court of Appeals, and that's of course by Singh Brothers. Uh, the other issue is uh, what what happens as of right now. Keep in mind that the stakes are high. Uh, the parties here, Singh Brothers, are likely to exercise uh, their right uh, to challenge. Uh, they can challenge uh, before the division bench as well as before the apex court. So that's something we'll have to watch out for. But for now, a definite setback coming in uh, for both the Singh Brothers. Back to you. Okay, so the only lack of clarity is from the Singapore case and how exactly that will turn out. Thanks, Ashmit, for simplifying that as, uh, for us. Now, uh, let's move on. The RHC holding, the parent company of Fortis Healthcare, issued a statement after the verdict. It says, and I quote, today's judgment by the Honorable Delhi High Court has given partial success to some of the sellers of shares of Ashwai Ran Baxi, which is the respondents. The court has held the award to be unenforceable against the... Welcome back. You're still with After the Bell on CNBC TV 18. Now let's talk about uh, uh, what we can expect from Budget 2018. In less than 19 hours from now, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley will be presenting the union budget for financial year 2019. And it, what could come as some kind of solace for farmers who find themselves in the midst of an agrarian crisis. We learned that a slew of pro pharma measures are in the pipeline. This includes a viability gap funding like mechanism for agricultural procurement. Ritu Parna is here with the exact details. Ritu, what exactly would these measures be and what does this mean for uh, farmers? So basically the government uh, will put in place mechanisms to ensure uh, that uh, the farmer and farming income doubles by 2022. Uh, and to start that, there would be, uh, you know, we expect some measures to be announced in the budget speech today. 
One of the measures which was being discussed, uh, I think, was a very advanced stage of discussion, uh, was one a mechanism through which uh, you ensure that uh, whatever uh, farmers uh, uh, you know sell in, the, in open market, and if there's a difference with the MSP, you pay a difference uh, of uh, the MSP at the selling price. So that mechanism uh, is being discussed at a very, at very high level, and there could be attention to that in the budget speech tomorrow. We understand that the government is open to you know, uh, have a substantial allocation to ensure that uh, whatever gap is there between any selling price by the farmer, that is, you know, reimbursed to the, far, to the farmer to a DBT like mechanism. Such schemes are running in case like my deportation. But we did two kind of mechanism. The central government follows on them. So that is number one. Secondly, on, you know, uh, farm sports uh, uh, a policy has been discussed for quite some time now. Uh, we understand that the uh, finance minister may mention uh, some details about uh, the agri-export uh, policy. Uh, okay. One of the principles would be to ensure that there is no need of uh, on export uh, or import restrictions. That's right. Fine. Okay, okay, Ritu, Ritu, we have you on a bad line, uh, but we will try to connect back with uh, Ritu. But some points that Ritu mentioned would be important for any kind of uh, leg up to the agriculture sector. But uh, talking about the wish list of India Inc., here's a quick roundup of what Indian businesses want from the finance minister from a corporate bureau. tax deductions for provisions on non-performing assets to incentivize the timely and adequate recognition of bad loans, the setting up of a dedicated fund to speed up the digital payment infrastructure in the country, and tax reliefs pursuant to companies, proceedings under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code are just some of the measures that banks are looking for in the upcoming budget. The life insurance sector is seeking a dedicated tax exemption window of rupees 50,000 under Section 80C and this will be over and above the existing tax exemption window here of rupees 150,000. Also, the life insurance space is seeking a blanket tax exemption as far as the pension policies of the various life insurance companies are concerned. As far as the general insurance space is concerned, that particular segment is seeking an enhancement in the tax exemption window with respect to health insurance premiums coming from senior citizens. The infrastructure sector is looking for increased budgetary allocation to flagship government projects like the Sagar Mala project, the Bharat Mala project and smart city projects as well. It's also looking for an increased allocation to the National Investment and Infrastructure Fund or NIIF as well as for current taxation issues with INVITS or Infrastructure Investment Trusts to be clarified. The big theme that India's FMCG industry is hoping for in this time's budget is revival of demand. The industry is hoping that the government will increase the income tax exemption limits for consumers, which in turn will increase the disposable income for them. Secondly, rural initiatives... Okay, we have uh, Larson and Tubro's results with us. So we're just loading all the details, but uh, it should be coming up on your screens in a short while from now. There you go, the Q3 numbers. The first number that we have is the net profit. It's at 1,490 crore rupees. Uh, we were expecting 1,443 crore rupees. So that does uh, seem to have beaten our expectations marginally. So that's as far as the net profit is concerned. Now, I'm getting the details one by one. The consolidated revenue is up by about 10%. Uh, I think that's on a year-on-year -year basis. So the gross revenue is, uh, it should be on your screens as well, but what I can see is that the gross revenue is at 28,747 crore rupees. Uh, this is an increase of about 9.4% on a year-on-year -year basis. Um, the management has said that there is some improvement in execution momentum and a growth in the services business, which has led to this. They have adjusted uh, for excise duty sub subsumed in GST. So if you adjust, if you take that adjustment, the revenue growth was 10% and not 9.4. Now, international revenues during the quarter constituted 35% of the total revenue, vis-a-vis uh, 37% -vis in the previous year. Uh, we do have uh, Abneet uh, Anand of SBI Cap Securities joining in on the phone line, and we'll get Varinder Pansal as well. Abneet, uh, a quick idea. You have seen the revenue figure and the PAT figure. Just a first cut analysis to you. Does it seem to be better than what you were expecting? Uh, Abhinit, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So, just first cut analysis, Abhinit. Uh, we heard the revenue performance as well as the PAT performance. Seems to be better than expected, at least on a very first cut basis. 
Yeah, so can you can you just uh, help uh, me? Yes, with the... so the gross revenue is coming at twenty eight thousand seven forty seven crore rupees. So that's nine point four percent of an increase, and PAT has come in at one thousand four hundred and ninety crore rupees versus our expectation. Our margins are also uh, in EBITDA margin is at about ten percent. Uh, just just left. Uh, okay, we have Arinda ready with us. Uh, Abhi, just just hang on. Uh, Arinda, just we'll just take you through the numbers. I don't know. One of the first cut seems to be better than what we were expecting. Well, it's a good set of numbers coming in yeah. there for you know. For L&T, uh, apart from the revenues and profit, uh, important is that EBITDA and EBITDA margins are also, imp- uh, you know, ahead than what Sheet was expecting. One number which I really want to highlight is the inflow number in terms of the order book, uh, you know, and that has clearly surprised me. Forty-eight uh, thousand crores, forty-eight thousand one thirty one thirty crores is the fresh orders what the company has booked in quarter three. You know, we were thinking that it was around thirty-five, thirty-six thousand crores, but forty-eight thousand crores. Is 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 a is a great number which is coming in. Remember, you know, in the last quarter, the, the, there was some apprehension in terms of whether the whether the company could meet that 12 to 14 percent inflow guidance or not. But uh, you know, this is a super number coming in in terms of the order, you know, inflow. And with this, the consolidated order book for the group stands around 2.7 lakh crore as on December, which is higher by nearly 5 percent. Uh, which is good i think all the segments i'm just looking at most of the segments most of the segments are expected to do good in this in this in this uh, you know in this quarter but uh, you know if you look at the segments uh, infra a bit is 918 crores compared to 879 crores which is good uh, it and technology has done well the financial services has done well uh, the development projects is is profit from loss so you are seeing most of the segments are firing up uh, uh, in terms of uh, lnt so you know, uh, I don't see any 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 reasons to say you know uh, the numbers are better clearly. The numbers are better than what we're expecting. Avinith, uh, you heard Varinder uh, go through the numbers. Uh, what stands out for you, as uh, Varinder was saying, the order inflow at forty-eight thousand crore rupees, a substantial improvement. Yeah, I think uh, the beat on the inflow is uh, the you know very good. In terms of the PNL, I think the m- margins, PAT, and uh, even the uh, sales numbers are largely in line with what we were projecting. We are at uh, 14.7 billion for the quarter. 14.9 is what has come. So largely in line in terms of the PNL, but I think inflows at 48 is uh, significantly higher. Uh, you know, during the quarter they had declared you know 35 plus uh, thousand crores of inflow, but 48 looks on to be on the higher side. Yes. What, what about the margins, Abhinit? Uh, uh, as far as the margins are concerned, seems to be uh, quite a steady performance. How sustainable does this look like? So, see, margins we were also expecting around 10.3 odd, which uh, last year was uh, you know 3Q of April 17 was around 9.7. So, I think uh, management guidance has been around that 25 basis point increase over last year. So, the margins are largely where Street was expecting. It has steadied in the last uh, two quarters. Uh, I would say largely in line with what we expected. Does this warrant an upgrade, uh, Abhinith? So inflow, see n- numbers. Uh, I don't know numbers for the year. Uh, it's largely in line, but I'm saying that the 48,000 inflow hmm. and uh, management commentary is very important yes. because 2Q they had uh, you know downgraded their uh, yes. guidance for a year, and that was a very sharp cut. Hmm. Uh, after a very sharp cut, uh, such a uh, hmm. you know great set of <laughs> inflow yes. uh, looks uh, really great from okay. that perspective. We have Mayuresh also with us, Mayuresh. Uh, uh your first reaction on the numbers are you surprised by the order inflow numbers as well oh absolutely varinder and again i think uh, top line more in more or less in line with estimates uh, but again the order inflow number is uh, exceeded i think most analysts expectations on the street uh, mm. and what this really does it i think it uh, gives lnt that ammunition probably to have uh, the run rate in the fourth quarter which is around 45 or 1000 crores uh, If they're able to manage that, I think you are looking at a substantial order book by the end of this year. So yes, I think uh, pleasantly surprised with the order inflow. You know, one of the reasons why the order numbers are really good. I'll I'll just finish this up because with L&D management coming up is because the infrastructure segment has won a fresh order worth twenty-seven thousand crores, mm. and that has registered a growth of twenty-five percent, and that has led to this uh, huge order inflow. Mm. Okay, we have the management uh, yeah. to go through the fine print. Uh, let's cut across to that. Okay. So good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for being here today uh, for our quarter three results announcement to the media. Uh, start with the disclaimer that uh, any forward-looking statements that we make in the course of this interaction 
is not something that uh, should be held against the company uh, for any future outcome. Uh, having said that, I think uh, we are happy to report uh, a very, very satisfactory quarter on almost all the parameters that the company judges itself uh, for performance uh, in, in the context of potential and the opportunities that are existing. Uh, just to take you through some of the major highlights of the performance uh, for the quarter, ended 31st December 2017, uh, the fresh orders that we won uh, is up by 38%. Uh, welcome relief uh, to the earlier two quarters where uh, the outcome was not proportionate to the effort that we had put in to, to win the orders. Uh, consequently, the order book has moved up uh, by 5% as compared to December of uh, last year. And uh, following out of the uh, efforts of the quarter for converting the order book into revenue, we've been able to grow the revenue by 10%. You will find in the reported revenue the growth is actually 9% for the quarter three. But uh, we have to bear in mind that the previous year's revenue numbers had um, excise duty, uh, which has got subsumed into the GST. So if you compare on like-to-like -like basis, uh, removing the excise duty from the previous year's numbers, we will find a revenue growth of 10%. Uh, once again, uh, the first two quarters we've been growing at about 8%. So it is a, a welcome uh, relief uh, for the company that it has been able to move uh, ahead on execution. Uh, the interesting part of the revenue growth we are reporting so far has been the improvement in EBITDA. There's a 25% improvement in the earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization. Consequently, the profit after tax reported by the company is up by 53% for the quarter. And the return on net worth, which has been one of the important parameters for value creation, has moved up to 14.6%. In so far as the order inflow is concerned, uh, the company has won uh, orders uh, in Q3 for about 481 billion rupees, uh, which is 38% uh, growth over the 349 billion of the previous year, quarter three. The significant portion of this uh, order intake has been the 70% growth in the domestic orders from 230 billion to 393 billion. I must hasten to add that many of these orders that uh, we won during quarter three, uh, which adds up to this 70% growth, have been in the works for a while. And um, as it happens in infrastructure segment particularly, and in project business in particular, uh, some of these orders bunch up and it's a happy coincidence that many of them uh, turned out uh, in our favor uh, during quarter three. So to that extent, there is a considerable bump up in terms of domestic orders. But this again endorses the belief that we have had during the course of the year, that considering the geopolitical developments in Middle East and the changing equations, India was uh, an area and a market that we were betting uh, on for our infrastructure orders. And we're happy to see that some momentum gathering pace in terms of awarding orders that have been uh, under evaluation for a while now. We do hope that this trend would continue, but with the usual caveat that we cannot commit on things that we can't control. But having said that, the company is optimistic that this trajectory will, will get ahead uh, in the subsequent quarters leading up to FY19, which is a big election year for the country. Insofar as nine months is concerned, uh, the total orders that we have backed is about 1.03 trillion rupees. Okay, it's a heavy day as far as earnings are concerned. There you go. We have ICICI Bank's net profit on your screens. So the net profit has come in at 1,650 crore rupees. Uh, Abhishek's poll had thrown up 1,816.8 crore rupees. So that's as far as the PAT is concerned. Uh, gross NPA figure has come in at 7.82% versus 7.87% on a uh, last uh, uh, on a Q on Q basis. So right now we just have the net profit figure. We're just going to get all the details. Uh, but remember, we had expected a number of 1,816 crore rupees. Uh, we have Abhishek. Uh, with us. I know Abhishek, you have to go through all the details, no, but, it's but just first the start NII, any... Yeah, hmm. the NII is at 5,705.3 crores. Uh, that is a growth of 6.4% on a YOY basis. We were working with a number of close to 5,893.4 crores. So there's a small, I mean, hiccup in terms of NII coming lower than estimates. Okay. No, I think uh, the 7.82 for me is uh, 
big relief. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we have to just wait for the press release because it is divergence, divergence, divergence that the street is watching out for. Uh, if there is any difference that uh, the RBI has picked up, then uh, that will be seen as a bit of a negative. It's the only hiccup that people are worried about. 7.82 otherwise is a very good number. And that's uh, okay. Within uh, lines I'll just go with expecting. the overall G, uh, yeah. G NPA has risen to 46,000 crores from 44,000. I don't think the street will take that seriously amiss. It's uh, less than 10% rise in GNPAs. But uh, let me just get to the press release to see if there is any divergence uh, noted at all. Uh, I can't see anything at the moment, but uh, hold your horses. Abhishek, okay. any, any other points that you can, uh, nothing, you can find in the release no. yet? Nothing as of now. The gross right. addition. Oh, there is slippages. Slippages have come in at 4,380 crores. Oh, very so good. So that is a substantial improvement given the fact that last quarter slippages were at 4,674 crores. So there's a clear decline of about 200 odd crores in the 300 odd crores in the slippages number. Uh, so slippages are at 4,380. Can we just flash the slippages number, yeah. please? At 4,380 crores. That compares to 46. Uh, seven four crore on a quarter on quarter basis. Actually, uh, um, uh, Abhishek, even recoveries and upgrades are a decent number at eleven hundred crore, one one zero eight crore compared to one zero two nine crore. So not a bad number at all. Uh, uh, the net NPA that's why has fallen to four point two percent. Very welcome. Uh, provision coverage ratio has uh, uh, now risen to sixty point nine. That's almost sixty one percent. Uh, it looks like there wasn't a big divergence because only if it's over 15 percent you have to report. So if they have not reported it, uh, uh, you know, specifically, it looks like uh, there is no problem that uh, uh, the RBI found. But uh, that's exactly what we will have to wait for. Uh, maybe we will get something to hear from the uh, company. But at the moment, that's the mm. biggest relief. If the markets were trading now, the markets would have been extremely happy. Uh, with this number is my guess. Okay, we have uh, Krishnan of uh, SBI Cap Security joining in. Krishnan, uh, you've uh, gone through the numbers as Abhishek and Lada were pointing out. What stands out for you? Yes, so, uh, to the extent that the uh, slippages during the quarter are broadly flat uh, compared to where they were sequentially in the September 2017 quarter, uh, that's, that's a bit of a relief. Uh, but then as you have been discussing in the show, I believe uh, the divergence disclosure, it could very well be that the, that the report has been submitted to the bank and hence the bank hasn't been able to take that into account either. So I think it remains to be watched whether this is factoring in whatever report or whatever audit uh, the Reserve Bank of India has completed in its mm -hmm. risk-based supervision or does this exclude it at this point of time? Well, well it actually, looks a little unlikely that... Uh, they would not have completed. It's fairly late uh, in the year. So my own sense is... Last quarter, it was, it was under review. So it yeah. had to come in this quarter. It would have. And so if, if it has not been reported, you know, it's likely that they might not have been... The divergence uh, is under 15%. 15%, huh, 15 plus may not have. But look at the credit growth. Now, credit growth, we were working with a number of 8 to 10%. That has come at 10.5% on a YOY basis. Mm. If you say that the last year had a lower base, then quarter on quarter, the loan growth is very strong at 4.7%. So if you analyze that, you're going a loan growth of close to 15 16 percent so even on a sequential basis the loan growth is pretty strong despite that you know uh, you know NII is lower than expected so there might have been slight uh, uh, you know uh, decline pressure in margins. margins yeah slight pressure but that is okay you look at the fact that slippages are getting arrested now that's a key highlight that slippages are being arrested okay I, I mean logically they would have given you the NIM number by now uh, but I, I, okay, domestic net interest margin is three and a half percent. That is, uh, how does that compare with uh, what we had in the previous quarter? Uh, three and a half percent margins, domestic that, NIM. Uh, so that is a 3.57 in the previous quarter, but YOY it was at 3.51 percent. So uh, not much of a hiccup when yeah. you compare so on a YOY. Yeah, basis. margins have not uh, moved much or moved at all. Not 
uh, not worth uh, uh, detailing too much on that. So it clearly looks like it's a very good set of numbers uh, because the slippages have been arrested. Mm. This is the lowest uh, uh, slippage that we have seen in what, six, eight quarters uh, for uh, ICICI. So maybe therefore the pain is out of the system. We will have to wait for uh, other drill down list uh, details. Manish Ostwal is also with us. Manish, uh, what have you made of the numbers that you have heard so far? Is the NII number a bit of a disappointment at all? Yeah, on net interest income side, the margin has declined from the last quarter to this quarter. Last quarter, the overall margin was 3.27 percent, and now it is 3.14 percent, and that is basically a miss on the NII side. Okay, actually, Ma Manish, I can just tell you the margin. Domestic net interest margin was 3.53, and the overall net interest margin is 3.14. So clearly, yeah. there is a decline. Because last time the overall margin was 3.27, right? So right. I think uh, there is uh, that much of a dip in margins uh, uh, because of the pressure of competition. Go ahead. Uh, uh, anything more, Manish? Yeah. yeah. Apart from that, the, on asset quality side, uh, especially the fresh slip, slippage and recoveries and upgrades, broadly in line with our expectations. So numbers are mixed big uh, in terms of NI and asset quality. And secondly, in terms of loan book growth in CASA, uh, especially loan book growth is positive surprise and mm. uh, CASA remains strong. So yes. overall, it's a mixed big number for MyCC Bank. Okay. So will this, Manish, you know, will this make you rework your numbers in terms of loan growth and therefore, you know, increase or decrease in your earnings estimate going ahead? So, as I said, the numbers are broadly, uh, the headline numbers, pet number and the core operating pro uh, operating profit is in line with my expectations. Mm. Okay, so you're not changing the price target or anything like that sure. as of now? No. Uh, what about you, Krishnan? Uh, f should the street be elated with what it has heard so far? Yes, sir. Uh, very clearly, if uh, this number is already factoring in whatever divergence the RBI had observed, mm. Uh, then it will be a positive surprise because that be, that means that the NPL formation clearly peaked, mm. and and as you as you also pointed out, uh, the upgrade and recovery engine also at times begins. So there could be sporadic, you know, upgrades and recoveries once in a quarter or so, mm. uh, and that always helps asset quality. So I think we think investors and this will probably be looking at the asset quality a lot more granularly mm. and if that gives a very comforting picture that's where you pick that's where okay but so far so good you would say i would think so yeah from whatever you've been saying okay. that, that's, that's the impression I okay well i actually even i am reading the uh, uh, press release and the notes to accounts both forwards and backwards and sideways but i have not uh, seen anything with reference to uh, divergence uh, from rbi's auditing and therefore Probably the divergence, if any, was below 15%. Uh, it is a little unlikely that it will come in the fourth quarter. Chances are that uh, it's come and gone and it's not cast uh, any aspersions on the bank's numbers. Uh, uh, well, that's all we have to say. Uh, 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 any a price target, uh, 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 Krishnan? And, uh, sir, uh, we have a whole recommendation and then based on the okay. uh, call later today, we, we might have to rework some numbers. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you very much uh, uh, for joining us, Krishnan. Uh, Manish as well. Uh, Abhishek, any other details that you want to uh, highlight? The provision coverage ratio now is at 60.9%. So that has crossed 60%. Last quarter, it was at 59.3%. So one will take uh, heart from the fact that, you know, provisions remain steady. You look at the overall provisions is at 3,570 crores. Despite the fact that your slippages have declined, you know, the provisions are on the elevated side. The provision coverage ratio is improving, which also strengthens the balance sheet, uh, you know, in one way or the other in terms of your asset quality going ahead. Okay, and then this is a bank with very good subsidiaries, so uh, capital is not an issue. Mm. And therefore, I would think 4% uh, genuinely means uh, that they have been able to tide over the worst period okay. in terms of uh, sticky loans. Uh, well, that's the quick take on uh, ICICI. The numbers look uh, uh, top line and bottom line in line with expectations and mm. asset quality actually mm. a big relief uh, okay. uh, that there are no, there is no bad news at all so far.
Okay. In, as far as management commentary is concerned, we are expected uh, to have the management in about an hour from now. So the fine print and the details on uh, the outlook on stressed assets, etc., is something that we'll have to wait for the management for. For now, we'll have to take a very quick break. But stay tuned for our special coverage of the countdown to budget 2018 and other headlines. Let's move on to uh, Budget Corner, on to CNN News 18's Axe the Tax campaign that brings to the Finance Minister what Aam Admi wants from the budget. The demand that was most talked about was the hike in the tax deduction limit under Section 80C. Zeba Barsi has the special report. Please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Aftab is a policy analyst, but to him, the budget is much more than a theory-based analysis. The bottom line is how it will affect his family of four. Wife Seba is a software developer. They have two teenage children and education expenses are heavy. Being both working parents, you know, we whenever budget comes, we always have our hearts in our mouth because Oh, there are a lot of expectations and most of them are dashed most of the time. Actually, I expect a lot of components like, uh, you know, the, the, the component about 1.5 lakh, it should be exceeded at least 2. If not 2, I mean, if not 2.5, at least 2. Then uh, they should also factor in other stuff like, you know, uh, house loans and even in the school's education, we, we get a very small amount of relief. Each year, the school hikes its fees by 10 to 15 percent. But for us, in terms of claiming the rebate, the amount and the ceiling remains the same. We pay through our noses for this, and we don't get any, any, any kind of a substantial relief. Raising the tax deduction limit under ATC will encourage investment. Government has to give us the relief within the uh, you know, framework of this investment that it always, you know, erodes or it takes away our, you know, disposable purchasing power and disposable income. And now with this demonetization and resultant clampdown on gold and all, no, there's not much to invest. There's not much. And then whatever you're investing in, for instance, like property, in, for instance, like property and real estate has been slightly lukewarm in the recent times. So, uh, you know, you don't have much options to invest. Medical insurance कहीं भी market realities के साथ बिल्कुल sink नहीं है। आप अगर कुछ भी कहीं भी जाते हैं तो 25,000 में कुछ भी नहीं होता है। तो that should be at least 50,000। इतना तो इतना तो exempt होना चाहिए। ATC covers a wide range of expenses which include provident fund deductions, life insurance investments and housing loan interest. A 1.5 lakh cap offers little scope for further investments. Dear Finance Minister, I request you to increase the ATC tax exemption limit from 1.5 lakhs to 2.5 lakhs at the least. With video journalist Guneet Singh in New Delhi, Zeba Varsi for CNN News 18. Okay, before we take a break, let's take a look at IDBI's uh, Q3 numbers. Uh, some important points have come in. Uh, uh, Lata, looks better than uh, expected? Uh, well, uh, better than uh, Q2 is the way to put it. Uh, okay. It's uh, a troubled bank. It was an ex-development financial institution and therefore mm. lent only to infrastructure. Mm. So they don't have that much of a retail book like an ICICI and other banks have. And uh, therefore, the pain is even more evident. But uh, it looks like the pain is now stabilizing. And there is an oh so small tendency of it coming down. See, the gross NPL as a percentage of total loans has come down from 28.9 to 28, uh, almost 25% to 
to 24.7%. Yeah. So there is a bit, you know, about a 25 basis point fall. And likewise, even in the um, uh, net uh, NPA, you will find mm. a, about a 20 basis point fall. Mm. Uh, for me, the even more important number is the aggregate NPA. Aggregate yeah. NPA was 51,000 crores last quarter. 90 days later, it is 50,000 crores. Mm. So these are, of course, baby steps. 50,000 crores is still a very big number. But these can only be, as you can see, gross NPA, 50,622. So there are baby steps be steps being taken yeah. to bring the pain under control and that clearly is evident uh, well uh, in terms of uh, uh, loans uh, one minute advances have grown okay at 31 12 it's it's um, uh, okay there actually has been a reduction in advances that mm. if you had not taken the reduction if the advances the, the total book itself has shrunk if it had not shrunk, then you would have seen, if they'd grown even by a little or even kept their book steady, mm. then their NP actually would have reduced much more. It would have looked like 23 or 22%. Mm. It is because that overall book has become smaller. As a percentage, the GNPA has not fallen very much. Yeah. Otherwise, in aggregate terms, the gross NPL has fallen. Okay. And even the net interest income last quarter, they did 850. This time, mm. they've doubled it okay. to 1665. That is still not enough to post a profit because <laughs> they have to make huge provisions. So it's still in losses but under the circumstances it's clearly a step forward rather than a step back okay we will have the idbi management as well so our hasrata will be back uh, with that but for now we'll take a very quick break stay tuned for more news and updates on the other side Welcome back on to an exclusive interview. Now, if the crude price keeps on rising, it will show its ugly head on the margins. That's the word coming in from the deputy CEO and CFO of Jet Airways. Speaking to CNBC TV 18's Utkash Atavedi on the sidelines of the Kappa summit, he added that the airline is focused on reducing the non-fuel cost, keeping in line with the 12% drop in second quarter. Listen in. The crude is inching. It's an always a time lag when you would see that the yields on the fares catch up. It has been a consistent phenomena. It could be a lag of three months, six months. So effectively after a lag, nobody would keep the or take the brunt of the increased fuel prices. But can we, can we see uh, an impact on margins because of it? On a short term basis, you would see some impact till the time the lag is there and you are not able to pass on. But you see at Jet Airways, our biggest focus has been the non-fuel cask, yeah. which we have been consistently dropped and we have already gone out in the marketplace to say 12 to 15 percent further drop. And that has been demonstrated even the second quarter performance by reducing from 323 to 307. We have spoken about uh, the fact that we will you know, cut down our uh, additional cost uh, uh, by 10 to 15 percent. Uh, where are we uh, on, on that front? So if you look at it from a 323 level, which we talked about, we have demonstrated in second quarter already delivered 307, which is 5 percent. And the biggest cost reduction item which we talked about is affecting January 1, 2019 which is to the tune of 650 crores on the maintenance cost. So if you incorporate that and few other items, we are fully on track to deliver the 12 to 15 percent. Okay, that was Jet Airways. But uh, as we've been talking about, there's been a slew of earnings. PVR has come out with its third quarter numbers. Nitin Su, the CFO of PVR, is joining in to discuss the company's Q3 performance. Uh, uh, Nitin, thanks for joining in on the show. Margins have improved on a year-on-year -year basis. So what exactly led to this? And can you take us and break, a, break through the guidance for Q4 and FY19? One of the big reasons for the margin improvement has been the strong growth in uh, FNB and advertising performance. Uh, I think on the box office front, uh, we were impacted during the quarter largely because of the fact that Padmavati moved and the film shifted to the next quarter. But I think we've managed a healthy ticket price growth. Uh, so uh, some total of all of that, uh, I think a decent revenue growth and a tight control over costs really has helped us to improve upon the operating margins for the quarter and uh, overall margins are up by almost 150 bips during the quarter. Okay, uh, you are pointing out, Nitin, that the average ticket price and footfalls have improved. So with bigger releases in Q4 to be lined up, can we expect this number to increase? We don't uh, forecast ticket price growth quarter on quarter. Largely on an annual basis, our average ticket price growth will be in the range of 5 to 6 percent, which is largely in line with inflation. Uh, so, uh, uh, 5 to 6 percent is the kind of annual growth that we aim to achieve. 
and uh, we are really hoping that Q4 will be a good quarter simply because a lot of big films have moved to Q4. Uh, January's had a decent start, even though we've had little setback on some states not being able to play the film. Uh, but I think the lineup is very good, and February and March should be a good quarter. So we're hoping for a, a better Q4 than uh, what we achieved last year. Okay, Nitin, appreciate you taking us through that. Uh, but here's another management, Mahesh Kumar Jain, MD and CEO of RDBI Bank, is joining in now, and Lata is here to take us through that interview. Over to you, Lata. Thank you very much, Kritika. Well, just for those who have jo just joined, you can see that the RDBI uh, net interest income has doubled. They posted 850 crore last quarter. That's Q2. It's 1665 crores in the current quarter. That has helped uh, the bank reduce its losses, almost halve it from 2,250 to 1,500 crores. So uh, uh, that's incremental improvement. Even if you look at the gross NPA number that's flashing by from 51,300, 400 crore, it's come down to 50,600 crore. Joining us now is Mr. Mahesh Kumar Jain. Mr. Jain, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, well, uh, uh, tell us there is incremental, uh, uh, you know, progress being made in reducing the losses. Are we one or two quarters away from black in the bottom line? Uh, first of all, let me briefly touch upon it that uh, what we talk about the turnaround strategy mm. of the bank to focus on the core business. Mm -hmm. We are on the lines. Yeah. If we see the our NII uh, numbers have grown and uh, even not only quarter on quarter basis, even nine month to nine month basis. Mm -hmm. The operating profit grew by 679% on quarter to quarter basis, but on nine month basis also, there is an improvement of 60%. Mm -hmm. Even if we exclude the extraordinary items, which is basically sale of known core assets, still in the operating profit from core business, 341% uh, growth on quarter on quarter basis and 15% growth on nine month to nine month basis. Mm. Despite of the fact, that there was a provision, one-time provision because of MTM losses, mm. which was to the extent of 474 crore in Q3, okay. which was not there in a previous quarter or the previous year uh, respective sure. quarter. Uh, so that's an improvement. And operating expense also we have reduced by the extent of 11%. Okay. We have increased the other income as well. So these are the key business parameters Fair. where we are focusing to improve our operating profit and it is consistently mm. it is going to improve upon okay can you tell us something now, with about regard to coming yeah. in the black probably we need to sorry go ahead sir sorry yes so as far as uh, these numbers are concerned we are in the trajectory of reducing our losses but uh, it may it may take another uh, one or two quarters more mm. Uh, where the losses will continue because of the aging provision and the higher provisioning requirement mm. and because of a certain identification of the slippages yeah. into the NPL category as okay. well. Okay. Uh, well, I wanted to ask you what you will do with the capital. You'll have got more than 10,000 crores of capital. Uh, what will it do to your uh, capital adequacy ratio? And uh, are you therefore likely to more aggressively provide uh, and bring down your net NPA? Uh, that is what basically is our uh, objective. If you look into it, that our uh, CT1 has improved from 5.64 to 6.62 mm. because of the capital infusion by the government as well as we have reduced our RWA, mm. risk-weighted assets. Yes. Risk-weighted assets in last 10 months uh, decreased by 24% mm. and over March it has reduced by 20,000. Okay. So apart from that, whatever additional capital infusion is, definitely we will provide mm. uh, because there will be aging provision and our PCR which has improved to 57 percent okay. will further improve in this quarter in Q4 as well. Okay. Uh, any ballpark figures at all uh, in terms of how much the net NPA can come down to? Net NPA, uh, it depends upon certain resolution. Earlier mm -hmm. we were expecting that whatever NCLT cases in Q4 there may be some resolutions mm -hmm. but now probably these resolutions may actual money may come in the Q1 of next uh, financial year. Okay. By that time, we will be able to substantially reduce our net NPA. Fair but enough. in Q4, our estimate is again 16%, we may reduce to around uh, 12 to 13%. Okay. Uh, so, you, the big uh, positive news is that uh, the aggregate NPA number has been brought down from 51,000 crore to 50,000 odd crore. Uh, is this now a trend? Can we expect lower and lower gross NPAs? Uh, 
Uh, it should be in Q4, there, there should be some uh, reduction in Q4, mm. uh, definitely. Okay. But to what extent we have to wait and watch because our watch list is uh, also uh, a little bit uh, uh, heavy. Okay. But we have to recognize because our mantra is we need to recognize we need to resolve and then we need to recover okay if it is not resolution i agree so with there you. is no point to push the issues uh, at the back okay so can you tell us any what what have been the fresh slippages and how they compare with uh, the q2 number fresh slippages uh, and if you have any recoveries and write offs A fresh slippages during this quarter was 4,127 crore mm. against the previous year quarter of 4,700 crore. Okay. And there are upgradation and recovery to the extent of 973 crore. Okay. Okay. Uh, your uh, deposits and advances have been inching lower. Uh, when can we see a growth uh, in your, I mean, uh, uh, both quarter on quarter and year on year, there has been a fall in advances, right? That's right. Actually, mm. that is because of the strategy. Okay. If you see our CASA, CASA mm. improvement is 36.14% CASA mm. against previous year of 2839 oh. and even on March 31.46. So, 5% okay. increase in 9 months okay. as far as CASA percentage is concerned. We are shedding our bulk deposit okay. and that is the reason why we are able to increase our NII despite mm. of having substantial portion of assets are generating lesser sure. income. And on advances side, again, there was a strategy that we have to come down in corporate book mm -hmm. and we have to increase our retail book. Retail book YOY growth is 10% okay. against the previous year growth of 5%. Okay. And the corporate book we have brought down mm. by extent of 24%. Okay. So that's a part of our strategy. Fair enough, sir. Uh, just a final question. Uh, uh, anything from RBI at all in terms of a divergence that you have to report? Yes, there are certain divergences which we have to report because the uh, cycle is over mm. and we got the list. Okay. And out of that around uh, 2000 uh, crore is left out which okay. will be there in this quarter. Okay. Out of the total divergences. But it's not more than 15%. We have already factored up to the uh, December quarter. It's not more than 15%, so you don't have to declare it. It will be more than 15%. Okay. So the divergence is around 2000 crores you said. Have to declare it. Okay, all right. Okay. No, divergence is 2,000 crore to be recognized in Q4. All Remaining right. we have already recognized. Okay. Would, would you be able to uh, give us the overall number of divergence? Uh, as of now, immediately I am not having all those right. numbers. Okay. But divergences are more than 15%. Okay, okay. Is there any change in strategy, sir? Because when the finance minister announced the allocation of uh, money, uh, allocation of recap bonds, he said, uh, the, 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 the DFS secretary said that each bank will follow its own strategy, its own core strengths. So should we expect anything in terms of a change, anything in terms of consolidation or privatization uh, for IDBI Bank? Uh, as far as uh, strategies are concerned, there are a whole list of the reforms okay. which have come along with the capital and really we appreciate the reforms which have come in. Mm. Uh, and those reforms are focusing on the differentiated banking, reforms are focusing on the governance structure okay. and they are focusing on the digitalization and the customer uh, reach and customer service. And these all four areas are on the top of our mind mm. and next board meeting we are going to deliberate upon mm. each and every point and definitely it will help the bank in working out and carving out a differentiated strategy that where we would like to be placed ourselves keeping in view our strength. All right, we will leave it at that. Mr. Jain, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining us with all those details. Okay, but uh, completely out of time uh, with that. It's a wrap on this edition of After the Bell. Thank you so much for watching. Reporter's diary will take all the action forward on the other side.